Now, anybody who follows me on various social media will know that I'm an animal lover. Animal lover first, but a cat person in particular. And that makes tonight's story ever so special. So, this is going out to all you animal lovers out there. Which basically, I guess, means everybody. <laughs> so, my dear friends, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and your cat on your lap if you have one. And listen. John and Anita moved into the house behind mine seven years ago. Just another young couple starting out. She always looked cheerful and worked as a vet tech while continuing her schooling. She kept up the hope that, one day, she would be an actual veterinarian. John had moved them here because he'd gotten a job at the local factory. He seemed a good match for her, open and friendly. The pair were quickly considered a part of the community. Three years later, he was a manager, and she found Sam. He was found hiding behind a trash can, a matted ball of fur hardly bigger than a hand. She cleaned him up, got him healthy, and loved him with no reserve. Sam was something special, and she took better care of him than some people took of their kids. Sam was more a dog than a cat in ways. Aloof? No. Strangers were just future minions to him. He grew to 15 pounds of solid black fluff that had a tiny kitten mew and tail enough for two cats. If Anita was home, he was right beside her. He made her life complete, it seemed. Even John seemed to adore that furry comedian. Sam was the highlight of my day sometimes. If the day was nice when she came home, she would have dinner on the patio, and Sam would chase imaginary mice about the backyard we shared. He would come racing up to me, chirping with little kitten mews. Leaping up into the chair, with me flopping upside down, back legs against the chair and head on my knee. He would grab my arm so I would pet his throat and purr like a Harley engine. Then there were the stories about life with Sam, such as the day he mistook bubbles for a solid surface. Bath time went from relaxing to life-threatening to hear the story from John as Anita blushed. Then got revenge, telling the tale of him leaping into the shower, and John fleeing the bathroom wrapped in the torn-down shower curtain. I got to witness the poodle encounter, a tiny black fluff ball just like him. Sam ran up to it thinking, hey, a cat friend like me. And then it barked. Sam managed to triple in size, forget how to walk, and sound like a kitten being murdered all at the same time. The poodle just sat with head tilted and one ear lifted. I suppose it was trying to figure out what was happening. Then Anita tried gardening. He helped, <laughs> honest. Caught bugs, got stung by a bee, managed to roll the sprouts flat repeatedly. But a few things survived him and grew. That's when he started bringing me gifts. Having a cat pouring at your patio door while holding a green bean or a cherry tomato is a sure way to lighten your mood. Watching him drag a whole carrot, top and everything across the yard, had John and I both laughing. Anita, not so much. Seemed the only thing in her garden he left alone was catnip plants. At one point he even brought me a cucumber. You know, that's the thing that cats are supposed to be terrified of. Life was good. Well, until a year ago. John lost his job when the factory closed down. So did a few hundred people. It hit the area hard. First few months were still good. He had hope. But it faded. Then he found a friend in liquor. First time I saw Anita sitting out on her deck at 2am, holding Sam close and crying. I knew that something was really wrong. Over the next months, her nocturnal sessions increased. 
The yelling seemed nightly, and I almost went insane the first time I saw Anita with a black eye. She said to hold off. No, John wasn't like this. Once he was working again, life would be normal once more. Only, he wasn't even looking anymore. Anita quit school. She worked two jobs to keep the house going. John took up residence in a local bar. She kept trying to make the marriage work out, even attending the new church he'd found on Sundays. Some sort of Bible-beating, ultra-religious thing that believed men could do no wrong. On those days I had Sam, so that he wasn't trapped alone all day. Truth is, she'd started trying to keep Sam out of John's sight. Even after church, she would come home and rant nonsense from the Bible. Her caution was needed, as it turned out. Somehow, John had it in his head that he'd been cursed. That something evil was in the house. Some token of bad luck. He was set on purging anything from the house that he might consider unholy. One night he decided Sam was the cause. An evil black cat had to be what was cursing him. He'd managed to kick Sam before Anita could stop him. Bruised, but not badly injured by some stroke of luck, Anita had to finally admit there was a real problem. Anita brought him to me, crying her eyes out the next day. She didn't dare leave Sam alone with John anymore. She couldn't let him be hurt. Sam liked me, and I loved him almost as much as she did. It took two stumbling trips to bring everything to me. At least this way, she knew he was safe, loved, and she could see him. I watched her heart breaking as she walked out. Mine did, as he ran to the patio door and poured at it. The tiny, distressed mews turned into actual yowls. She was Sam's world. Every evening while John was at the bar, she came sneaking in, apologizing for disturbing me all the time. I told her if she didn't come, Sam would make it impossible to sleep. She lost weight, gained more bruises. Sometimes... She would just slide down to the floor and hold Sam like an infant. Both of them needed that comfort. John came home earlier than usual one night, pounding on my back door, screaming about killing Sam, that the cat was evil. All black cats were bad luck. Ugh, witches. Kill Sam, and he would be able to get a great job again. If it hadn't been for that cat... Anita would have given him a son like a proper wife. I called the police while Anita cringed, holding Sam in the bathroom. They took him away for the night and filed a restraining order yeah, for all the good that that did. I came home a week later, to my back patio door busted in, and Sam dead on my kitchen table. That sick bastard had beaten the cat against every surface of my kitchen. Blood and black fur everywhere, and then pinned the remains to my table with a butcher knife. I sent the police to Anita's work. I tried to clean it up, keeping her from seeing it, but the moment the police came, she ran to my house. I had seen her heart break, and now... I was watching her soul shatter. She cradled the mangled body against her and just rocked back and forth. I swore I heard her humming. The police followed. Even they looked sickened by the sight. They called an ambulance when it became clear that Anita was in severe shock. It was, in a way, a miracle. Had they not been standing there with us, had they not seen that Anita was in an almost catatonic state, then we might have been murder suspects. But they were there when we heard the shouting, the glass breaking. One lifted Anita up and ran to the front yard. 
his partner calling desperately for additional backup. Gun drawn and covering our retreat from my house. He sat her down in the back seat of his patrol car, pushing at her to lie down. I got in on the other side. I pressed her down, covering my head with my body, trying not to retch at the scent of blood and death from the thing in her arms that had been Sam. Chaos. More sirens, lights, screaming and shouting, gunfire. I lost all track of time as I tried to protect and comfort Anita in that too hard back seat of the squad car. She never stopped the odd humming, never reacted to the sounds and lights. Even when it was finally quiet, we were locked in the car. Eventually, a pale deputy arrived, shaking as she opened the car. Paramedics pulled Anita out. She was limp, and they were able to remove the feline body from her grasp. I wrapped him up in a towel one of the officers had fetched from my bathroom. I finally learned a bit of what had happened. John was in their house, tearing it apart, screaming that he was going to kill that damn cat again until it stayed dead. And Anita as well. Something about a Bible verse. He had been shooting at shadows in the house. I asked if they'd fired back, and the officer shook his head. <laughs> Looked like he started slashing his face to ribbons with something. Right before we kicked the door down, he slashed his throat with it. They're looking for it now. Almost would say a cat's claws, if the paw was the size of a human hand. Eh, we'll find it, I'm sure. Anita was sedated and taken to the hospital. I, with the help of one of the officers, took Sam's body to one of his favorite hiding places in my backyard. We buried him under the lilac bush. No one wanted to treat him as evidence, and no one wanted Anita to have to see that wreck of a body again. Next day, a group of my co-workers and Anita's came over. They scrubbed my kitchen, repainted, threw away the table, and replaced the patio door. Did everything we could to erase the night before. As long as you didn't look across the yard and see the bloody handprints on the windows of that house, well, and the fluttering yellow tape. I walked over and looked through one of the windows. Something was written in blood on one wall. Exodus 22.18 Anita was released from the hospital, with no home to return to. So, I took her in. At first, I wondered if she could really handle being in the house Sam was murdered in, looking at the home that her dead husband had destroyed. She was still very groggy. The doctor gave me instructions for the sedatives to keep her on, until she had a chance to start coping on her own. She went straight to the kitchen, smelling of fresh paint and Lysol. She opened the patio and, for a moment, I thought she would walk toward her old home. Instead, she sat down in the chair she always took when visiting. I wondered if I should show her where Sam was buried. Then, she trilled. That odd sound she always made to call him. I wanted to cry. I wanted to wrap arms around her and tell her to stop it. But a tiny, squeaky mew, more of a kitten sound than a full-grown cat, answered her. A muddy Sam came racing through the yard and leaped up into her lap. She buried her face in the fur and cried. I was in shock overjoyed that this rare and special cat was alive. He hadn't been able to catch Sam, had instead caught another black cat. That's why he'd beaten the body to make it unrecognizable. God, he wanted to torture Anita. He had tortured her. 
so I did hug her and the filthy cat. She looked at me. Sam's back. <laughs> he needs a bath. I was laughing to keep from crying, and I have a feeling he'll require a blood sacrifice for that. No, he wants to be clean too. She was smiling with the look of a proud mother at the purring, green-eyed cat. Days later, the police released the house. A company came in and cleaned and removed all evidence of the gruesome suicide. Anita said she'd like to remodel it, seeing as it was almost gutted now anyway. I was shocked she was willing to move back into it, but she said it was her home and Sam's. I was mowing the yard while she talked with the contractor. That's when I noticed the disturbed area beneath the lilac bush. Oh, the other cat, I thought. Poor thing. Was someone out there looking for it? Oh, I should call the local animal control. Then, I noticed it. It was dug up. No, no. It looked like something had crawled out of it, the dirt pushing out over the mulch rather than having been scraped away. I went back into the house. The bloody words I'd seen written on one wall through the window the morning after. Exodus 22.18 The Bible was on the top shelf of my bookcase, a little neglected and dusty. Exodus 22.18 Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. I heard Sam chirp and looked to see Anita standing there with him. <laughs> John was an idiot. Only a human can be a witch. Well, what a delightful little story that was. Even though the cat wasn't the perpetrator in the end, I think it's f safe advice to say, never mess with the kitties, okay? They're stronger than you might imagine. Well, if you like that one, I'm inviting you all to stick around for another cat story. Yeah, indeed. Bonus story this evening. And it's a fantastic one from Mr. H.P. Lovecraft. So, either stick around or I'll see you again next week. <laughs> okay, enjoy. Well, my dear friends, those of you who've been following the channel for a while will know that I've been promising for an eternity to do some Lovecraft at some point. Finally, after being prompted by the Red Queen, I've got around to doing a delightful little story. Those of you who follow me on Twitter will know that I'm a cat lover with several of these crazy beasts wandering around my house. So... It seems fitting that my first piece of Lovecraft should be devoted to these wonderful creatures. Sit back and relax, my dear friends, with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky. No man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Miro and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords and heir to the secrets of Hori 
and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbours. Why they did this, I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill the cat should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel. And from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently or console himself that by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day, a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow, cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver, and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers, none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies, and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns, and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menace, smiled more often than he wept, as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menace could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, Certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun, and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand. Though, Indeed, the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, 
of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again. And the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, grey, striped, yellow and white. Old Crannon, the Burgermeister, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's skitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, to a breast, as if in performance of some unheard of rite of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So, Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger. And when the people awaked at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth. Large and small, black, grey, striped yellow and white, None was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marveled not a little. Old Crannon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their sources of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the Burgermeister decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in doing so he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and Thul, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this, two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thul were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned 
and given a sweetmeat as reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small menace and his black kitten, of the prayer of menace and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traders in Hatheg and discussed by travellers in Nir, namely, that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>